This is No Better with your host, Kipper Jones. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Know Better with Kipper Jones. I am your host, Kipper Jones. I am a singer, songwriter, entertainer with a conscience, and you are watching a young man live his dream. So thank you for tuning in. I appreciate you for taking out the time. So let's just go ahead and get started. Tonight, we want to make sure that first things first, we talk about the census. We know that it's going on. We know that most of us have received our our census information either in the mail or we've uh, already completed it online. One way or the other, it's 2020 and it's time to take care of the census. So we know that um, that we're, we're uh, in the middle of a pandemic which has kind of interrupted their regular process, but we wanna make sure that everyone addresses the census because remember, it's about funding for your area. It's about congressional representation and above all else, it's about your legacy. As I've explained several times, uh, my brother and I were doing some research on Ancestry.com and so much of the information that we found out is from the census of decades and generations past. So if you wanna make sure that your descendants, generations from now can find you, you wanna make sure that you take part in the census. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, and also make sure that you Check around in your neighborhood, check around in your church, check around through your family and make sure that everyone has either internet access or that they have a way to mail in their census information. So it's very, very important, crucial, dare I say, uh, that we all are addressed in the census. Make sure that you are counted. Um, it, it means everything from medical care, child care, your highways and bridges and roads, just everything that the government funds, we wanna make sure that we are addressed and not forgotten, all right? So that's thing number one. Thing number two is if you live in the state of Georgia, you will notice that we started early voting this week. We started early voting yesterday, uh, Monday, May 18th, and we have some unprecedented numbers happening right now. We had uh, 15,000 people to vote in-person voting, even in the pandemic. Um, even with reduced polling locations, uh, even with the uh, uh, physical distancing uh, and, and, and all of that going on at one time, we still had 15,000 people to vote in person. Um, and uh, I, you know, if you've been watching No Better, you know I've been advocating voting by mail, absentee voting to make sure that your vote is registered and counted because we don't know what's you know going to happen. I mean, uh, we've had uh, an early reopening of our economy, so I mean, we could have a, a resurgence, and uh, you know, they might shut down early voting. So we don't know. Voting by mail is the secure way to make sure that your vote is counted. Um, obviously, I'm not the only one that's preaching that because we had 45,000 early mail-in votes. Uh, absentee ballots that are mailed in so far. And uh, those are those are pretty large numbers. So once again, that's what we're advocating. Um, and now here's another a little, little anecdote when it comes to early vote, uh, absentee voting. So I had a friend who was taking her ballot to the post office and not just going to drop it in the mail, 
but take it to the post office. Uh, she put a stamp on it. Um, they're not giving you just free postage. So she put a stamp on it and was going to mail it. She took it inside and found out that it needed two stamps. Please, people, if you are going to mail your ballots in, we don't want to give anyone any reason, any cause to return that or not count it or it not be accepted. Please either walk it into the post office yourself and make sure that you pay for the postage or just put two stamps on it when you mail it. Okay, that's the, I don't know, there's a caveat in there somewhere. Make sure that you put two stamps on that thing to mail it in because it's over the weight line for just a regular envelope. Uh, so we want to make sure that it gets counted and we want to make sure that, that gets turned in. Um, so that's, uh, that's number two. Number three, um, you know, we usually have a, a medical professional on the show to talk to give us our COVID update, our COVID-19 update. Um, and I've been so blessed uh, while we've been in the six weeks, this is week number seven, while we've been in the six weeks doing this show uh, to have uh, Dr. David Melbranch, Dr. Nathaniel Curry, um, Dr. Quentin Robinson, uh, to actually take out time. All of these guys are on the front lines during this pandemic. And for them to be able to take out time and come here and share with us some valuable uh, factual information when it comes to COVID-19 has been amazing for me. Um, and so I, I got a little spoiled, I must admit, um, because tonight I wasn't able to reach any of them. <laughs> They're all very, very busy and out on the front lines and we're all praying for them as they're um, having to be first responders and, and deal with this thing head on. Um, mm. And so I'm, I'm very, very grateful to them. But there is some information that I'm able to kind of dispense while, while uh, they're absent. And that is this. Uh, as of this afternoon, uh, today, May 19th, the United States has 1,556,006 active corona cases, coronavirus cases, um, with this number is startling with 92,098 uh, deaths. Um, I remember a few weeks ago when they were saying that, you know, we had surpassed the total of people who died in the Vietnam War, and that was at 40,000. And we're now at 92, 92, uh, soon to be 100, and it's, it's staggering. Um, and it's 20,950 more than our last show, which was just two weeks ago. Um, and, and even in the state of Georgia, we now have 38,739 active cases um, with 1,667 fatalities. And uh, again, just astounding. Um, and then, then we have this situation where our governor um, rushed to open the state's economy with you know, opening barbershops and hair salons and nail salons, and we know the drill. Um, but then the AJC and the Los Angeles Times just posted, and this is, this is astounding, that Governor Brian Kemp lied about the COVID cases going down and uh, just ignored the science and, and came up with his own numbers. And that's, I don't know, it's just very dangerous and highly irresponsible. Uh, and, and I'm just gonna leave that there. But um, according to the Los Angeles Times, time will tell if Georgians will pay the price for the irresponsibility and incompetence of their leaders, or if they'll catch a break. Hot, humid summer weather could send coronavirus into remission, unearned by responsible public health strategies. One thing, however, is certain, wishful thinking isn't going to end this pandemic. If the numbers look too good to be true, they probably are. So stay home if you can, wear a mask, and don't let politically motivated talk of reopening low you into a false sense of security. So we know, listen to the science and pay attention to good sense and use your own wisdom. You know what to do and make sure that you wash your hands accordingly. You'll see on our lower third, we have some advice and some numbers. We have the CDC information if you'd like to uh, access it. So we really appreciate all of that. Um, now, which brings me to my, 
my first guest tonight. And uh, actually, she's my only guest tonight. And I'm quite honored to have her. Um, so as we are entering into this election season, um, we're going to try to call in and uh, uh, some of the candidates who are running for office here. We have state officials, we have local officials, and we have national officials. And uh, my first guest tonight is actually a candidate for the uh, 13th Congressional District of Georgia. And that would be uh, the one, Miss Keisha Waits. Keisha, are you there? Uh, uh, I am here. Thank you for the opportunity. Oh, no. Thank you so much for, for taking out the time. I know your schedule is uh, hectic. Anybody that's on the campaign trail is, is bananas. So I, I really appreciate you taking out the time. And I appreciate you being very patient with our, our login process. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a dinosaur and I can tell you that I am not technologically savvy. And so I'm grateful for your patience with me as well. Oh, no. Thank you so very much again. Um, all right. Well, let's just get to it. Um, I've got a lot of stuff I want to run, run by you. Um, first and foremost, um, uh, the subject of incumbency. Um, you're running in a district uh, where Congressman David Scott has served the Georgia 13th for some 17 years. Um, so needless to say, he has a bit of a foothold on the electorate. Um, now, this is a twofold question. Um, a, why do you think you're a better choice at this time? And B, would you support term limits for congressional seats? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to answer the question backwards, and, and absolutely, I certainly would support term limits. I had the privilege of serving uh, three terms in the Georgia House of Representatives, uh, in which I left uh, to seek higher office. Um, with respect to the congressman, I think when Congressman uh, Scott took office, the seat holder, in 2002, the climate uh, was very different, Kipper. Uh, we were not dealing with a national uh, crisis at that particular time. And frankly, I think his legacy speaks for itself. And furthermore, I believe it's unproductive to be critical uh, of our leaders. I, I think it's unnecessary. Uh, however, I do think it's time that we pivot and go in a different direction. Uh, I believe that the current climate today demands an urgency. Uh, I think that we have to have our local leaders and, and, and national leaders be present uh, during times of crisis, specifically when we need them most. And uh, I can tell you that I'm a trained crisis manager. I've spent the last decade uh, working and serving as a crisis manager, doing some of our nation's worst disasters, just to name a few, Hurricane Katrina, uh, H1N1 pandemic. I went to Flint following the water crisis, uh, the BP oil spill. I've spent about almost a year in Puerto Rico addressing some of the challenges of Hurricane Maria. And I say that to you to say that I'm no stranger uh, to navigating murky waters. Uh, but I do believe we're in a different climate today. And I do believe the electorate needs something very different. Uh, one of the number one challenges I hear on the campaign trail is constituent services. Uh, I believe that if you are going to represent it in, us in Washington, then you've got to be able to be available to hear our concerns. Uh, and finally, I think that if you're going to run as a Democrat, certainly you must support Democrats. We can't have Democrats that uh, are endorsing Republicans and voting with Republicans in terms of those values. And, and I'm very clear that we're in a very murky environment with partisan bickering. And so I understand the need to work together. However, I believe that if you're going to put your name out there as a Democrat and run on the ballot as a Democrat, then you certainly must represent those concerns uh, of Democrats. Indeed, and well said. Um, we are in a very polarized uh, environment right now. And that's, uh, uh, it almost goes without saying. Um, uh, we had a situation in, uh, in DeKalb County with one of our uh, uh, Congress legislators, I'll say, uh, with uh, a very uh, duplicitous, I suppose is the word. <laughs> that's uh, a good way to put it. <laughs> political role yeah, yeah. Um, and and so yeah so I, I think it's uh, um, in the old church they used to say you know God can't use no lukewarm Christians uh, <laughs> and don't need no coward soldiers so um, so I, I understand what you what you say when you say that so yeah so thank you for that um, 
All right, let's jump, jump into some heavy issues here. So I kind of um, wanted to talk about decriminalizing marijuana. That's, a, that's an issue that's kind of at the forefront of uh, the millennial generation's uh, uh, question list. Um, and so the decriminalization of cannabis uh, is different than legalization. And, 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 and I, I kind of had to study to find that out myself, uh, like what is the difference? Well, so decriminalization of cannabis means it would remain illegal, but the legal system would not prosecute a person yeah. for possession under a specified amount. Instead, the penalties would range from no penalties at all, civil fines, drug education, or drug treatment. Now, legalization of cannabis is the process of removing all legal prohibitions against it. So my question to you is, which are you in favor of, if either, mm -hmm. and why or why not? Mm -hmm. Well, y y certainly I think this is going to spill over to a national conversation. But, th but let me start with saying this. Uh, local leaders have made decisions in terms of how they want to handle this issue in terms of the decriminalization piece. Uh, regarding the legalization piece, certainly that would have to go before the General Assembly for a vote uh, and, and hopefully be possibly be put on the ballot. I don't see that happening anytime soon, given the conservative nature of our state. Uh, in terms of what I support, certainly uh, when that conversation came up, I certainly support the decriminalization of marijuana for two specific reasons. What I have found is that some of these petty charges have been used um, in a way, I believe, in terms of there's a disparity. Uh, I find that uh, African-American males are more likely to be charged with uh, a crime of a low ounce or a small position of marijuana versus other uh, individuals. And so for that reason, it is very clear to me that something needs to be done in terms of that conversation. Regarding the legalization of marijuana, that is a very different conversation. I think that that is something that should be left to the voters to decide. Um, personally, uh, coming from a family where drug addiction has been a major issue, uh, certainly I have those concerns, but I believe this. I believe that just as much, uh, frankly, I find alcohol uh, to be uh, far more dangerous uh, than marijuana. Uh, I can tell you that, you know, personally, I've never engaged. Uh, and so it's not something that I can speak to personally, but legislatively, it is my belief that voters should have the right to make that decision in terms of what works best for their family. I can tell you as a member of the Georgia House of Representatives, I did support uh, the legalization of medical marijuana, which it passed overwhelmingly in the House as well as the Senate and was signed by the governor. And so that's some work that we're extremely proud of. And we've certainly have seen the medicinal benefits uh, of marijuana. And so uh, certainly I, I'm open to that conversation. And I can tell you that when that opportunity comes, I certainly will always be on the side of the voters. And if that is something that the voters desire in our state, I certainly think that should happen. Uh, the other piece that I think is interesting is that you've seen other states such as Colorado benefit from the financial piece, from the revenue. Uh, and so I, I don't know how much longer it will be before you see a national vote. So I first, first, certainly anticipate uh, that being an issue nationally very soon. So, yeah, that was going to be my question because you kind of talked about the state side of it. And, and I know that... Um... You know, it's been like a piecemeal kind of thing. It's this state and yes, and that state, no, and Colorado and, and California and you know, Maryland. Correct. We have that that sort of uh, uh, method of, of uh, snowballing, I suppose you would say. But um, yeah, so I just I wanted to kind of know from a, a because it's, it's, you're you're moving on into the big house now. Um, so from a federal standpoint, um, what your viewpoint was. Um, I, I personally, I think alcohol is far more dangerous uh, from everything that I've read in my research uh, in terms of if that vote were held today, I would probably vote for the legalization of marijuana. Uh, however, with that said, uh, I think that it's important to note that we, uh, our community, specifically marginalized communities and African-American communities deal with uh, challenges in terms of alcohol and drugs. And certainly, I think that we would be remiss uh, to not... Uh, have a conversation regarding the complexity of this conversation. And so I think it's very easy to, to make a bunch of statements regarding what you would do, but I think it's also important to be pragmatic and thoughtful that there's another side to this conversation. 
Sure, sure. Yes. Um, I, I think that addressing drug addiction as a health crisis and not a criminal situation, I think. Absolutely. That, you know, uh, that's how we, you know, got into the full war on drugs, as it were. Absolutely. You know, which is more on war on drug users, <laughs> criminalizing people for using drugs and allowing them to still come in the country. This is something. Absolutely. Like and, and I will be very open to the revenue generated uh, from the legal sale uh, of marijuana to use those funds to address a lot of the challenges that are underfunded today. So mm. I see a lot of opportunities there as well. Mm. Very good, very good. Well, thank you, thank you. Um, Georgia is one of very few states, um, and I think there may be only three left in the United States that does not have hate crimes legislation. Mm -hmm. um, it's interestingly enough, um, I have lobbied with uh, with Georgia Equality um, and uh, with the Counter Narrative Project uh, at the uh, Georgia State Capitol for hate crimes legislation for the last three years. I, I, I show up. I mean, I'm, I'm there. Um, and now that we are in this situation where um, the, the cameras are on. Uh, everyone has seen the video of, of Ahmad Arbery, um, that tragic video. I, I have not seen it. I won't watch it. Um, and so now the conversation has begun in earnest, it appears, about a hate crimes legislation um, actually being uh, moved through the Georgia State Legislature, uh, House Bill 426. Um, and your uh, your old uh, uh, buddy across the aisle, uh, Representative David Ralston, yeah. <laughs> uh, Speaker of the Georgia House of Representatives, have, has called for the state Senate to pass the bill with no delay and no amendments. Um, and it, it really reminds me of uh, Bloody Sunday when uh, John Lewis and his his cohorts crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Uh, into a hornet's nest of police uh, brutality. And the only reason why then the Civil Rights uh, Bill was, a Civil Rights Act was passed is because that was televised all over the country and people saw it and they couldn't believe the hatred and the, the, the heinous way that these people were being treated. Um, so now that we've seen this video of Ahmaud Arbery, now they wanna pass a hate crimes legislation in the state. Um, so, uh, I just think it's a shame that someone has to die for people to get it, mm -hmm. but what could you do, uh, in your new capacity as, uh, the congressperson from the 13th district, uh, to ensure that that legislation is passed? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there are a couple of things. I, I think Kipper is important for us to talk about what's already been done. Uh, as a member, very early in my career, I actually sponsored a piece of legislation. Uh, the language actually came from the former member of Rashad Taylor, who sponsored the year before I came. So in 2012, I actually sponsored a piece of legislation, actually got a hearing and got some movement. Unfortunately, it never really went anywhere in terms of a vote. Here's what I would say, two things. Sometimes opportunity comes out of tragedy. It's, it's not something that I'm excited about or none of us uh, wish uh, to have a casualty or the loss of life. Uh, I have a father, I have a brother, I have a nephew. So that particular case completely hits home for me. Uh, I have a brother that's struggling with drugs as well. No comparison to this situation with this young man. Certainly uh, his life was robbed and stolen from him. But this is what I would say as a new member of Congress, a couple of things. I have existing relationships in the Georgia House of Representatives, as well as on the Senate side. Uh, I was very successful in passing legislation on both sides of the aisle, which I think will be necessary in the climate we're about to face in Washington. Oftentimes, I hear other candidates speak as if there's a magic wand, as if you can get things done. The reality is there are 434 other members in Congress. So the likelihood of, of them agreeing with everything you think is probably very, very slim. But the reality is this, the world is watching, not the nation, but the world. We have an opportunity in Georgia to do something unique. I am encouraged to see 
the speaker call upon this piece of legislation to be passed. And generally, that's a pretty good signal that it will pass this cycle. Uh, so one, there is the opportunity. The next question is, what do we do going forward? How do we ensure that this never happens again? Certainly at the federal level, it is time to tackle this at a federal level. Uh, I am all about states' rights and states' issues, but I think given the use of force, I think given the number of cases that we have seen in the last decade, it is necessary that we tackle this issue at the federal level to one, equalize the playing field so that we are all speaking with one voice that this is unacceptable and this can no longer happen in the United States of America. Uh, in terms of would I be interested in sponsoring a bill like that? I think it's important to learn the climate. I think it's important to figure out who your allies are. And certainly, I think after we are able to, to, to make those determinations, I think that there are plenty of opportunities out there. Uh, it is my hope uh, that justice will be served swiftly. I'm deeply concerned uh, that we haven't seen a lot of movement and traction. Uh, but at the same token, we don't want to botch this. We want to get it right. We want to make sure that we have all of the information necessary uh, to bring justice in this particular case. And I don't want to uh, uh, make any statements prior to the findings uh, of the courts. But I think this case is pretty egregious. And I think that anyone, Republican, Democrat, Black or white, will all agree uh, that this case, uh, cert certainly uh, something is wrong. And uh, this is a tragedy and a stain on the United States. Yeah, and I, I think uh, to your point, it's it's compounded by um, some conspiratorial, uh, I don't know, uh, situation in the background with the DA and the relationship with the uh, the accused, and it's 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 a lot going on. It's 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 very convoluted. Um, so you know, it's not just the violent act itself, uh, or mm -hmm. what do they say? It's not just the crime, but it's the cover up. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and, it, it, this is not the first time we've seen this happen in the United States as no, a history. No, and so not. those are some of the things that I see that we can tackle at the federal level. Uh, when you have these types of cases that happen, that you immediately have the attorney general's office get involved, that you have the investigation be taken over at the federal level. So those are some of the things that I think that we can put in place uh, to make sure that justice is being served. But I want to pivot. One of the things that I think, and I believe that the current president of the United States is extremely dangerous. I believe that his behavior, I believe that the actions that he has taken has further polarized our community and created a lot of the violence, uh, as well as the audacity of individuals to hunt and chase down another human being. I think that that has been perpetuated under this particular administration. And you mentioned those long voting lines. I am super encouraged, given that the urgency and the, the, the situation of COVID-19, you still have voters black, white, Republican and Democrat going to the polls. And so I'm very encouraged that we will send a very, very strong message to Washington and that this is just behavior that we're not going to tolerate any further. Yeah, thank, thank you for that point. Um, I, I think that this administration has emboldened a certain sector of society and uh, made them feel as though their behavior is sanctioned. Um, and, you know, you brought up the attorney general you know, we, when the attorney general is the attorney of the people, you do enter into a situation like the Ahmad Arbery case, like the, um, uh, the young lady, Ms. Taylor in uh, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you- Centoya should, Brown, Cent Tennessee. Wow. Sandra Bland, think. Texas. I mean, we can go we on We could go on and on and on. Right, exactly. Thank God, Centoya and, Brown. And it's, and it's painful to say yeah. their names. Yeah, Cent Centoya Brown is at home, God bless her. I'm so happy for her. She recently yes. got married. Very excited yes. for her. Yes. I watched her uh, documentary on Netflix the other night. Yes. It was just awesome. Yes. But um, but she is one of a very few that escaped it. Uh, and and like you said, but the attorney general that we have now under this administration is not the attorney of the people. He is uh, the attorney of the president. And he is, and so we face a certain, uh, like you said, danger. I, I, I would use that word when we are not even represented in a legal way on the federal level. Um, so, which brings us back to the voting and having to understand that it is not just the president that you're voting for. It's, it's, 
it's the cabinet, it's the administration, it's those officials that represent you legislatively, uh, judicial, judicially, and all across the board. So, you know, it's important that we get out and, and vote, so. Absolutely, and, and, and I'm not sure, you know, we have six counties covered uh, in District 13. I wanna name them very, very quickly. We have Douglas, we have Fayette, Henry, South Fulton, uh, Cobb County, as well as Douglas, and uh, missing one, Fayette. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that because there are some judicial races that are on the ballot. I, I, I cringe when people say I don't vote in the judicial races. One of the most important races that you can vote in, uh, specifically marginalized communities and people of color, are in those judicial races because that's where those decisions are made that deeply and intimately impact your day-to-day -day life. And when you have individuals on the bench that are not compassionate, that do not that have integrity, uh, and that do not represent our communities, you see cases like Centoya Brown. And so it's extremely important that we come out and vote all the way down the ballot in all of these races. There is an urgency that is necessary in this. In fact, I will say this. I believe that this would be one of the most important elections in our lifetime. I said that about the previous one in 2016, but in the aftermath, in the aftermath of President Trump, I believe that this election today will be one of these most important elections here in Georgia on June 9th. Indeed, indeed. Okay, I don't wanna, I don't wanna take up too much time there. I gotta move out, I got so much I'm sorry. to ask you. No, it's great, it's great. Um, so uh, again, we are in a, uh, a time where we're not just polarized uh, between Democrats and Republicans, um, we're even sub-polarized between progressives and moderates in the Democratic Party. Um, so much so that, uh, you know, some people say that they won't vote for a moderate Democrat. And we all know what happens when you don't vote. So um, that said, some of the issues that uh, were uh, brought to the fore by uh, Elizabeth Warren, uh, Bernie Sanders, like um, uh, student loan debt forgiveness, um, uh, Medicare for all. I wanna kind of talk about a couple of those things. Um, uh, so student loan debt forgiveness. And you said in a debate that was held by the Atlanta Press Club that you believe in the programs that already exist for individuals working in public service and that, and that you would support measures to reduce the barriers like tedious paperwork that exists to those working in public service jobs to obtain their loan forgiveness. And that you believe in the programs that, uh, yeah, that you believe in those programs that already exist for them, pre uh, individuals working in public service. Now, your fellow Democratic candidate, uh, Dr. Michael Owens, on the other hand, believes that student loan forgiveness must go further. Canceling student loan debts for all students and banning credit card companies from college campuses. Um, would you care to, to elaborate on as to why you think the current policies are enough? Well, I, 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 what I said is, is that I think it's important to note that there are policies that are in place that are ineffective that do not work. Uh, I, I find it interesting, again, when you have not served in a legislative body, it's very easy to make statements about what can be done and what cannot. And I'm certainly I'm not going to make any excuses. What I will say is this, certainly if we could forgive every single student loan in the United States, I'm going to vote for that. The likelihood of passing something like that in a Republican controlled Senate is very, very, very slim. So what you do is you look at those things that you can actually accomplish. What can we get done? We know that right now that there are student loan forgiveness programs available to individuals who serve in public service. That could be via law enforcement, that could be uh, public education through teaching, uh, uh, nursing, fire service, all of these different uh, uh, jobs qualify for uh, loan forgiveness for public service. However, there are some rules that are in place. There are some requirements that you have to pay on it for 10 years. There's an overwhelming amount of paperwork that you have to turn in, blah, blah, blah. What I am simply saying is that I think it's time that we streamline the process, that once an individual has served a number of years and each state can make that determination, whatever number of years in their particular field, we forgive their student loan. There are no hoops to jump through. There are no thousand sheets of paper. It has nothing to do with your income because you chose, and that's the basis of the program. Uh, regarding the other piece, uh, uh, forgiveness of student loans, I've indicated to you that that comes with a pot of money, 
uh, we have to have a way to fund that. And uh, I'm certainly open to hearing uh, how we can fund that and looking at the fiscal note in terms of getting that done. But what I don't want to do, Kipper, is make a bunch of blanket statements and promises regarding some things that we actually cannot accomplish in a polarized environment such as what you have today. So I'd like to streamline the process and fix what is broken in the existing system. system. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, health care. Yes. Um, health care is at the front of America's conscience even during the pandemic. So uh, now, just as with uh, our uh, esteemed uh, colleague who now wants to um, deal with tackle the hate crimes legislation, uh, Senator John Cronin, uh, Cornyn, I'm sorry, from Texas, <laughs> this is so, this is almost comical, who voted to block or repeal the Affordable Care Act at least 20 times now suggests that there's good news and that people who are affected by the pandemic can get coverage under the Affordable Care Act or, or by Medicaid based on their income. Um, did Texas even ever do Medicaid expansion? I don't know. Isn't anyway, that, they, they did not. They, they did not. I didn't think so. I, I didn't think so. <laughs> Most I red Georgia, states did not. I know Georgia has it because uh, I've lobbied for that as well. But um, so that said, <laughs> So single payer, single payer health care is a system in which the government pays for health care for every citizen. Uh, and uh, however, opponents of single payer health care point out that countries with public health care often have long wait times and limited access to some treatments. Medicare for all, the Medicare for all plan from uh, Senator Bernie Sanders would create a single national health insurance plan for every American managed and paid for by the federal government. The plan builds on Medicare, the popular national health insurance program for Americans 65 and older, and for younger people who are disabled. Now, you've said that you are in favor of a single payer program. Would you care to explain what you see as the difference? Hmm. Well, I did. I said that I certainly supported 100%. The other piece, though, I think is important is to talk about the upfront costs, and you've already mentioned some of the other barriers and challenges surrounding that plan. The, the other piece that I think is important to, to note in this particular conversation, given COVID-19, healthcare will be the number one issue in this election cycle. Like you, I've lost people and friends uh, to this particular virus. So this is an issue that, that certainly will require a, a, an immediate level of urgency. And it is my hope uh, upon taking office in January that this is something that we will see uh, upon a new vote, hopefully with a new president as well as uh, a, a, a Democratic Senate that understands the value that healthcare should be an American right. I think it's important to, to look at in the United States, we must have the will. There are a number of things that we invest in in this country uh, that, and I'm going to mention corporate welfare tax, I think is the number one issue. The reality is we know right now that everybody does not pay their fair share of taxes in the United States of America. If individuals who had affluence and wealth were paying their actual fair share, and we cut out corporate tax, a lot of the things that we're speaking of tonight, Kipper, we can actually get done. So it's a matter of having the will to do it and having the resources to do it. And that's certainly something that I would be very interested in co-sponsoring and signing on to make happen. Um. That's, that's interesting because I, I researching this, I really, because you know, I've always heard single payer, no, we need single payer, no, we need Medicare for all. And I'm like, well, isn't that kind of like the same thing? If you got a single payer, you have the government paying for your healthcare, right? And that's like one thing. But I think the confusion comes in, especially with a lot of people who already have their insurance plans. They already have insurance that they've had throughout their lives, throughout their jobs, their careers, and they don't want to compromise it, lose it, change it, move it. Um, and so how does that, how do you address that? Um, well, I think that the market should, should, should remain the market. I think that those opportunities should still exist. I don't think there's a reason to tamper with that. What we're speaking of right now is individuals who are underinsured and uninsured. I believe that insurance should be an American right in this country. And what we also know, if we can pass uh, multi-trillion dollar bills and legislation for stimulus packages, then certainly we can figure out a way to mm. ensure that every American is insured. When you have individuals that go to an emergency room with pneumonia, when you have folks who, who have simple, uh, small health 
issues uh, such as picking up high blood pressure high blood pressure medication show up in an emergency room that creates a strain and an unnecessary wear on our existing system so what we're simply saying is yes there will be an upfront cost however if you have healthy Americans if you have individuals who are getting the necessary care that's necessary uh, to make them healthy teaching people about nutrition and families about nutrition I think you will have a far better healthy society it is no secret that COVID-19 has hit minority and marginalized communities harder. I offer to you, many of them probably are uninsured. I, I, would, I would venture to agree with you. Um, okay, so your first day on the Hill, uh, which would be what, January 21st? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, amen. I, I was Amen. <laughs> I, amen. Okay. Um, what is your agenda uh, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, because I, I I know you to be uh, a very uh, a, 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 what they used to call a go getter. Um, you go after it. Now, what is your what is your first day about? Mm -hmm. Well, the, the first thing, uh, Kipper, is that you, you have to sit on the right committees. And, and this goes back to, to some of the things that I was talking about in the debate that you referenced. If you're not sitting on the right committees, the, the thought process that somehow you're going to influence and shape some of those conversations, I think, is a bit naive. Uh, and so one of the first committees that I would ask for to be assigned to would probably be healthcare, given the challenges that we face here in the state of Georgia. I would also like to be to serve on the fiscal oversight committee. Uh, we know that right here in Georgia, there are a number of predatory lenders uh, that have taken advantage of marginalized communities as well as people of color. So I'd like to serve on committees where I can have a direct impact on those things that are most important. And finally, while I was a member here in Georgia, I served on public safety. I am very interested in a national hate crimes piece of legislation that is bipartisan, uh, that is supported by Republicans as well as Democrats to ensure that what happened to the Arbery family never happens to in the United States again. Uh, however, we have to remember, this is not the first time. There are too many. There's Eric Brown. There's Trayvon Martin. So there are too many individuals uh, lives that have been impacted uh, by a lack of justice in our country. And so I certainly want to sit on the right committees where I can have the greatest level of impact. Awesome. Awesome. Keisha Waits, you're awesome. And thank you so very yes. much for taking out the time to join us on No Better tonight. I really thank appreciate you. it. Um, hey, uh, I, I have to ask my producer something. Jack, do I have five minutes? Yes. <laughs> Um, good, because Keisha Waits, I want to do something. I don't get to do this very often. I mean, we've had a very serious discussion here. And so I kind of want to add a little levity to the moment, if you don't mind. Um, I have this little game that I like to play called Think Fast. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jack, can you get my clock up there? Let, let's do it. We got, we got it. We got 60 seconds and I'm just I'm gonna... a boy game girl. I love it. You love it? <laughs> I love it. This is exciting. Cool. So, uh, Jackie, let me know when you get that clock up. Kipper, and... I, I do, I I'd like so, to give a, a 30 second closing remarks. After oh, we absolutely. Our, 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 okay. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. Okay. All right. You ready? And... Ready. Go. Go. Ready. All right. What was the first concert you went to and when? Can you hear me? What was the first concert? I can hear you. Come on. Come on. You got 60 seconds. New edition. When? I'm the 10th grade. OK. Mac or PC? <laughs> the best barbecue I in Atlanta. I didn't even log on to the <laughs> The best barbecue in Atlanta. Oh my God. Daddy D's. Come on. Uh, your favorite Frankie Beverly and May song. Before I let go. I, I thought Beyonce did an amazing job. I but I do like Fat Man I love that. Okay. Uh, wine, red or white? Definitely red. Uh, Five, who said texture of chocolate? Eddie Murphy. I'm done. 
that that was fun. Now, 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 the issues that we're going to be tackling in the DC are certainly going to be a little bit tougher than that. But a little I'd bit like tougher. to just close. Thirty seconds. I I I, I want Absolutely. to close with this. I, I you know, Kipper, and I should have opened this way. I am a woman of faith. Uh, my anointing comes from a whole different level in terms of the calling on my life to do this work. Uh, this is something that I am very, very passionate about and I'm dedicated to. Uh, every single day that I wake up, my goal is to figure out how to make this world a better place than we found it. To much is given, much is expected. And I certainly look forward to earning the trust of the voters. I thank them for the confidence for those who have supported me. And for those who do not, I look forward to earning your trust and your support. Mr. Waits. Thank you. thank you so very much. Pleasure's all mine. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight to Know Better with Kipper Jones. I want to thank the Status Network for giving a singer-songwriter with a conscience an opportunity to use it. Thank you to my producer, Jack Trey Wallace. I appreciate you. Uh, to The Voice, Mr. Reggie Prime. To my manager, Johnny Cornegay, who I have to wish a happy birthday tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, to David for sharing me with the world. And thank all of you for tuning in. I hope that you take something away from this evening that made you more informed than when you tuned in. And to remember the words of Dr. Maya Angelou to do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Mm -hmm. Knowing is hot, knowing is love. Go to kipperjones.com and download my new single, I Want You. You can still get it for free. And also, if you like the Know Better mugs, remember we still have these, uh, you can get your own. Go to KipperJones.com and click on the Know Better Show. And until next time, take care of yourselves and take care of each other. God bless you. God keep you is my prayer. The views and opinions expressed on Know Better are those of its host and guest and do not reflect those of the Status Network or any of its affiliates.